You're listening to The Footy Fill with Phil Davis and Alison Zell. Phil Davis, it is a new week, a new state, and a very different location for the two of us. Welcome to this week's episode of The Footy Fill. How are you going? Alison, thanks for having me. Yep, we are back to the computers for this episode. <laughs> um, I think we're sort of technically, we'll touch on a second, but I think we're about 10 metres away from each other, but absolutely zero ability to see you because you I know everyone wants to talk about the derby and we'll get to that but the <laughs> other big story is obviously this the, the quarantine COVID situation and yeah Toby Green headlined it <laughs> but you were caught up in it too and you're in the middle of your 14 days. Yeah it's a little bit I get a bit upset when it's like Toby Green missed the derby and I was like I missed the derby too. Why yeah. does no one care that I missed the derby? The bench was a very different place without you. Um, I don't believe that because I don't speak on the bench. Yeah, but it's just that calming presence of someone. Not <laughs> so, um, no, obviously you're, um, you know, working towards hopefully getting out next week and then, you know, tier three, tier two, we're not sure, but we just follow what the government say for us to do. And, yeah, um, yeah obviously you're stuck in your room at the moment, just getting to work there and overlooking the pool. I am. So I can watch pool recovery. Um, we might go into the details in the next segment about how it all unfolded, but the upshot is yes. Um, I, along with nine other players and staff made the, seemed like a good idea at the time, decision to go to a Wallabies game. My first and only ever Wallabies game, um, which turned into being a tier, for us, a tier two exposure site. Um, so pretty confident I don't have COVID based on the fact that we've already had two negative tests in the last week, but doing my bit and in hotel isolation like everyone else until the 27th of July. All right. Well, we're all, we're all thinking of you, um, but I guess the one positive is that you should have had plenty of time to work out your fun fact of the week. So you say that I actually didn't even bother going to get a fun fact of the week because I just thought I'd talk about this. My fun fact of the week might just have to be that I'm in isolation because yeah, it I seems it's like a good fun fact. It's funny how like quickly two weeks quarantine or isolation goes for people that you sort of know um, <laughs> at a distance and then when it's someone you know, it mo- it's a glacial pace and then I presume for the person actually doing it, which is you, it's even more glacial and even more annoying than like even I could imagine. No, it's so far so good. I said to so you, um, been very well looked after. I got um, you dropped off uh, some chocolate last night outside the door. No, obviously no interaction, but dropped it outside the door. And then once you leave, I'm allowed to pick it up. Um, that was very kind of you. Because had- things are allowed in, they're just not allowed out. No, I can put them out, but if they get put out, someone has to obviously like disinfect everything. Biohazards before- too. Yeah. yeah, so I'm still out because I still need to like like wear in our hotel rooms and that's it. So I've been leaving like my plates and some rubbish outside the door because yep. I don't really want to fill up my room with rubbish. You can't give me a block of chocolate. No. Well, no, I could, but you'd have to disinfect it first. Yeah, but someone else would do that. Anyway, we're getting distracted. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's like it feels like it's going – well so far ken has messaged me this morning and asked how i was going and i was like is it bad if i'm like fine yeah i feel as though the first few days might be like a little bit of you know novelty and then i'm expecting to wear off at some point but you're seven days in though maybe you've done most of the hard work yeah exactly so um it's 14 days from exposure we obviously found out on sunday night of the game so we're on day seven today so like that's a it's a win as well would you say you took it better than Toby Green and Matt DeBoer? Um, I would say that's correct. I went into like, I'm a very practical person, so I went into problem-solving mode. So it was like, if I have to leave, so like there was, that was sort of the rumour that started circulating, what does that mean from a work point of view? So then I was just in like, okay, well, these are the things I would normally do. Who's going to go and do them? This is probably where I give a big shout-out to uh, Tom from the Gold Coast Suns, who I called at. I reckon it was like 5.20 when I was getting all very real and said, do you reckon you can come to Metricon Stadium? And he was there before the before the first bounce what and media managed for me. So um, he got a well-earned case of beer delivered to his, uh, yep. his workplace. Um, so then I was just like, yeah, like what do I normally do? What can I do? What can't I do? 
who's going to pick up that kind of stuff. And then it was basically just waiting around to find out if we definitely couldn't be there. Um, as you said, Toby and Matt DeBoer not thrilled about the news would be another no, statement. No, 45 minutes from playing, which is probably a little bit challenging. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it was, it was interesting, but we'll get into the game, but obviously it didn't affect our start. So, um, mm. well, I'll bring a fun fact then. Yeah, please do. My fun fact is that all giant pandas from around the world zoos are just on loan from China. No one else owns them. China just leased them out. That's a good fun fact. I like that one. Yeah, so I was happy with that because I remember, I'm going to get the names wrong so I won't even try, but when I was in Adelaide growing up, they got a zoo, a zoo, they have a zoo, and they got <laughs> two pandas. And like that was just a massive deal, like a huge deal. Um, I can't remember their names. One side with an F, one side with a W. <laughs> but that was a big deal. So anyway, I found that out the other day and that was quite interesting. That is good. I really enjoy that. Um, I actually went into some booty chat. Let's do it. There's a big, big sound from the west of the town. So as we said, a bit of drama leading into the Sydney Derby. I, fit, I came to forget. So Tuesday last week we recorded an episode in Melbourne with Jake Riccardi talking about Euro 2020. A lot changed in a very quick amount of time. So it was Wednesday night we got the call. Wednesday we night we got a message at 9.35, p.m., mm. of which a few players were asleep um, yep. to be, meet an emergency meeting at 9.50 to then get told that we're going to Brisbane the next day and we had to have our bags packed and downstairs at 6 a.m. Couldn't drop them off the night before. We had to drop them off at 6 a.m. the next day. <laughs> and then you would have an hour until the bus left at 7 o'clock. So yeah. it was a turnaround. It was a bit hectic. Um, do you reckon who – so we had players who were at Frozen New Musical. Yep. We had people like you who were out to dinner or off-site. Yep. Um, Nick Haynes walked out of the lift with a small child and that yep. was like one of the most perplexing things either. I've ever seen. No, not his but related, so he was babysitting. Um, so it was just a bit of mass confusion. But someone asked me, they were like, how did everyone take it? And I was like, everyone was just like, yeah, sure. Like <laughs> we've done this yeah, before. Not, not a lot of, lot, of, lot of other options to do because then all of a mm-hmm. sudden you're in Brisbane, you spend the day in Brisbane and then the next morning you've – drive to the Gold Coast. So we did three hotel rooms and three nights, which was kind of cool. Mm, mm. But now um, settled, settled on the Gold Coast. Settled on the Gold Coast, which is which has been good. But it was a pretty frenetic sort of a week. Um, I'd made the big effort to get Wally down to Melbourne mm. because Greta, we were hoping that she'd go on the transition hub last week. So I got seven hours with my little buddy and then mm. had to leave him with my friends. Um, cause he was going to stay there, but I was going to try to go backwards and forth and help out where I could. Mm. Um, and then unfortunately, no bingo had to come here. And so while he's in Melbourne stranded and Greta's in Sydney stranded, but good news from today is that it looks like we'll be able to get our partners and families up to the Gold Coast. Yeah. So by the time this goes to air, the transition hub will be officially approved. So it starts on Thursday. So, um, obviously really fortunate, but it has been four, day, four weeks sorry, away from home at this point and clearly uh, no prospect of returning. So um, that'll be great to give all players and staff an opportunity to, to get their families and partners up if they can. Yeah, I think the, un- the, the one that gets missed a lot is the staff. I think the players was very fortunate. We've got the Players Association who can represent us, but there's not exactly – I know there's a Coaches Association and there are other – you know, bits and bobs, but, you know, they're often the staff and, and coaches are often the ones that probably don't get thought of as much. And in particular, you know, the ones with families, that, you know, the young families, that's really difficult going away. So it would be great that hopefully a few families and partners and the like can come up and just ease that, you know, that burden that you can feel when you're away from your family. So that, that was exciting and, you know, we've, you know, we've got five plus weeks left and there's still plenty of football to be played. Yeah, absolutely. So on to the footy chat. We know it was obviously sort of – I reckon we arrived at the ground about 4.40, 4.45 on Sunday for a yep. 6.10 game. It all sort of went down in terms of players being told they may not be able to play about 5, 5.15. 
Um, and I guess the upshot was Toby Green was obviously out of the game. Matt DeBoer was due to be the medical sub, so he was out as well. Tanner Bruin came in for his first game of the season. Uh, sorry, first game in a little while. Um, yep. And then Zach Sproul into the Medi sub. And as you said, it didn't seem to affect, uh, affect the boys, particularly in that first quarter. No, he started really well. And the other curly one was because it was a double header, we weren't allowed in the change room until 4.40. So for mm. people like myself and Josh Kelly like to get there two, two hours, 10 before a game, that was a bit different. But, you know, they kicked the first goal, um, which was pretty unlucky. And then um, we just played some really good football for 55 minutes straight. Probably gave away three easy ones before half time, But even at half time, we were three goals up and in what I thought was a really strong position. And then, unfortunately, they, they, they came out really hard in that third quarter. And I thought we tried really hard, but then they just were able to capitalise. And then before you knew it, you know, they were three goals up. And you know, I thought we threw a punch at the start of the last quarter. Mm. But they were, just, they were too good. So it was definitely a frustrating game, particularly how dominant we were for the first 55 minutes. Um and then all the sort of the key statistics switched after that, and why'd that happen? It's it's hard to tell. Um, they're obviously they're obviously a good team, and they were able to bounce back. But you know, disappointing from our point of view. Obviously, losing Kelly and Flynn um, mm -hmm. was an ideal, um, but you know it was pleasing on one side because we we're able to start so well and try in trying circumstances. But so disappointed that we couldn't maintain the rage. Yeah, so I think there was some interesting commentary out of the game. Obviously, um, plenty of plaudits to the Swans. You saw there's a, a fair bit of emotion happening post-match. I think it's important to remember all of the challenges that they had on Sunday that they were able to overcome. We still had to face them. We just didn't win the game of football, so it doesn't make the challenges um, any less significant for our people. Um, you know, we had two of our analytics guys um, not able to be there. So um, they were gone. We had a coach on the bench was gone. Uh, we have a welfare manager gone. Um, Me, along manager. With the players as well. Me, look, I'm, I don't think I play an invaluable part, but no, I wasn't there either. Um, so I think that that does make a difference. Um, I think some of the frustration from Giants fans, we've spoken about inconsistency a lot here, um, was feeling like the Swans – change something at halftime and we didn't was that the case um i didn't notice any change from their point of view um i guess from what i could see was just the fact that they they probably went to another level and we probably stayed the same maybe went a bit under because we we're trying to you know they definitely didn't change anything in the uh in the third quarter or fourth quarter mm -hmm. they just did things better like we were dominating contested ball um, you know, they didn't put any more numbers around the ball. They didn't change mm -hmm. how they were trying to move the ball. But, their, you know, their tackling and their pressure improved. So their, you know, their ability to win their own football and their clearance work got better, which then for changed the complexion of the game. Uh, and we were trying to do a couple of different things once it wasn't going away. But unfortunately, we weren't able to stop them. They're, they're a good side. They're probably the most informed side in the game at the moment. Mm, absolutely. So what do you take? out of that game because I know I know fans are frustrated by the inconsistency but I think um, players and coaches and staff are equally trying to figure out how we fix that that as well yeah. first and foremost I definitely I definitely feel for the fans you know they're they're there watching and you know they're trying to pick, put together the inconsistencies but I guess for us we're still a young team we're still trying to you know put things together on a more consistent basis like we talk about and we're putting an enormous amount of effort into that and I, if I was them I, I'd be really proud that you know we're about to start a game and we lose probably you know a top five best player in the whole competition mm -hmm. isn't just not allowed to play a leader in Matt DeBoer is not allowed to play there's all this hysteria and yet we were able to start in such a way that I thought was really 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 positive we had every right after the week we'd had just like Sydney mm -hmm. to start slowly um, and then but we didn't and we just you know, we just weren't polished in, in big moments and gave up goals, which were crucial. I guess football, you know, is such a big game of momentum. That's sort of, to me, the area we're not quite nailing at the moment is, you know, we're just giving up big moments that we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to have Stephen Cornelia back out there? I think that sort of got lost amongst all of the, the drama of Sunday night. Yeah, obviously Stephen's had a, you know, a challenging a challenging year in terms of you know his body and not playing for a while but I thought it was great that we were able to give him two weeks in the reserves because 
you know, he looked pretty sharp for the majority mm-hmm. of the game. And I think that's really positive. You know, he's still, we're still trying to find our balance in that midfield. Hopefully Josh Kelly's okay to play this weekend. So there's always a bit of work to be done. That's going to be, you know, we're looking for that optimum synergy when, when Steven's there and all our big guns are, are available. So it was just pleasing to see the number three running around and the, and the skipper leading. Um, Tanner Bruin was one who obviously came in late. How did you assess his performance? Because I know you're a big Tanner Bruin fan. Yep, I'm a Tanner man. And um, <laughs> obviously, I, you know, I thought he had some really, really good moments. And, um, you know, like any young player, you know, he probably had good quarters and, and bad quarters. But I thought overall he contributed quite well, especially for someone that just got the phone call late to be like, you're in. Um, he was able to get himself ready and start particularly well. I think he would have had his hand in three or four goals and kicked one himself. So, no, he's progressing really nice. And I think, you know, off the back of that, we can expect him to play a few more games for the rest of the year. Was there anything else you, you took out of out of this game? Because I'm going to be honest, there was a bit going on and I don't reckon, like I watched the game, I don't reckon I took in very much of that game. No, no you, you had enough going on. Um, no, I guess... The big one for me is just the disappointment around Matty Flynn being injured. We're obviously mm. waiting to see exactly what the go is there. We hope it's okay, but, you know, to have it come out twice is usually not a good sign. And, you know, I thought he after the first five minutes of the game, the next sort of 40, 45 minutes against a very good player in Tom Hickey, he was outstanding. So that's going to be a significant loss for us um, if Matt's out for any extended period of time, especially when Kieran Briggs is in lockdown as well. So yeah. we'll have to roll out the big Mumford again. Um, yeah. so, or we have to get a bit creative. So fingers crossed for, for Matt Flynn, um, but, you know, you always get a bit nervous there. So that's a pretty big storyline from my point of view. And then outside of that, you know, I thought, you know, yeah, there weren't a lot of players that didn't try to put their best foot forward. So we just need to keep on chasing that consistency as we touched on earlier. chat about the rest of the round of footy it does feel like a lifetime ago to be honest um but it did kick off just after we'd landed in brisbane um with a geelong and freo game where i think uh geelong could probably flex their muscles didn't they yeah that was a uh, very very powerful performance by geelong i think that was up there with you know one of their most comprehensive comprehensive performances of the year so they look sharp and they've still got to find a way to get Rowan, Cameron and Duncan and a couple others back into their side. So they look like they're starting to sharpen the pencil with, with you know, five games to go before finals. And then I thought on Friday night I saw one of the more amazing performances mm. by Richmond. I thought they were just outstanding. Um, you know, it's amazing to see Rewalt in his 300th, who's just been a terrific player, turn on. Turn it on and kick and kick the lazy six in his 300th, which was just an amazing performance by him. And then, you know, Nane Curvis was huge in his first game back. So they were very, very impressive. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if you look at, you know, even the Gold Coast, you know, we're able to put in a really good show against the Doggies as well. And they've shown that their form is, is here to stay, which is really good. And, you know, Hawthorne and Melbourne on Saturday night was another big storyline. And the, my question for you, Zelly, is do you care about the draw? Or would you rather someone on the mark, 30 out directly in front, f- five shots each, penalty shootout style. Yeah, penalty shootouts were the real um, question. And as someone said, I can't remember who it was, but no one likes penalty shootouts in soccer where a penalty is part of the game. So mm. I'm like, why would you want someone kicking for goal when I feel like – so like I feel like in a game like soccer – Goals are obviously the ultimate aim, but they're so rare. So it makes sense that that's how you decide a game if you can. Whereas I feel like our game is just made up of so many different elements and there are equal amount of forwards as there are midfielders and defenders. So why are we just getting a forward to kick a footy? Why would it have to be a forward though? Sometimes the sharp shooters are in the back half. Like Isaac coming, dead idea. That's true. That's true. Harry Perry goes forward on the weekend and splits the middle. We've had this question before. Who would you – so say – I think you can tell I don't like the idea of a penalty shootout, just leave a draw. We don't have that many of them. It's fine. Um, Who would you want to represent the Giants? Oh, yeah, great question. So I'm going pick one, Callan Ward. Mm -hmm. Toby Green would be my second pick because I think he'd just kick it. I don't think he's necessarily the second best shot at goal. 
but love the moment. I think you just want that. Daniel Lloyd, three. Perryman, four. And the fifth I'd be up to negotiation, but (laughs) like a a coming or a hopper or a Finlayson would all uh, would all be in my sort of in my discussion for him. Mm, what do you There's think an of argument for Sproul as well. There's an argument for Sproul yeah. as well. But um, I think we, we he hopefully he can play a few more games and show me at AFL level how dead-eyed dick he can be. Yeah, so that comes off a, a history of knee fall and VFL form where he's known for kicking maths goals. Yeah, and the boys just rave about his set shot. Kicking, but we've <laughs> seen it train, which is very good. But, no, nah, Cow would be my first choice. I like that. But do you like the idea of a penalty shootout? Yeah, I think it's a funny novelty. Like, I just think that a set shot with a man on the mark 30 out directly in front or even 25, like, no team's kicking five out of five. And you yeah, shouldn't miss. And you shouldn't miss, but someone's going to miss. Oh, just the – I mean, you saw it after the Euro final, just the pressure on the people if they fail. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't be putting my hand up. <laughs> no interest. Yeah. I don't have enough set shot. I like myself as a set shot, but I don't have enough experience. So uh, no, I, I think I think let's just be serious. I don't think it's there. But if I really want it, I'd be happy with it. I think it'd be quite funny. Yeah, fair. What else uh, caught your eye during the the round of footy? Considering there was so much else going on uh, across the round, there there were some good games across there as well. Yeah, there definitely were. I, I think the hardest thing that I is that I can't really critique the AFL at the moment. It's just the fixture is very challenging at the moment with the time slot. So two, four, mm. three, five games on Sunday. We're at 6.10. We're sort of juggling the pieces. So it was actually more challenging to see all the games than, than normal. Mm. Like I didn't see any of the Eston and, and North game, but North seemed to be in a really good spot. And, you know, obviously Jake String was a, was an instrumental in that game. Um, but, yeah, they're sort of – Trying to keep up with with all the games has been a bit challenging. They're moving, you know, especially after today. I believe the two games that were meant for Adelaide Oval this weekend look likely to either be in Melbourne or uh, Queensland this weekend. So, well, updated yeah. update: the two Adelaide clubs. So, for clarity, we're um, recording this on Tuesday afternoon, but um, the two Adelaide clubs have just been sent back from the airport, and now they're talking about whether they play a showdown this week in South Australia. Uh, and flip some more fixtures. So I think the answer is no one knows. There you go. Well, I guess for me, I was disappointed that I didn't get to see a lot of the football on the weekend because there were some really good games. And I think it's been really nice to see, you know, Adelaide pushed West Coast. Um, Shout out to Brody Smith and Nick Natnu in their 200th, uh, both Mm. really good people. Um, But Adelaide, Hawthorne, you know, Collingwood took it to Carlton, North Melbourne, a lot of, the teams at the bottom end are playing some really good football and challenging the teams up the top. Yeah, which I think is, we've spoken about that even competition, but it just becomes more and more apparent every week. I think obviously the COVID stuff is hard to get away from. Obviously we know that there's people from our club affected, but there's people from the Swans affected. Um, the Bulldogs have Josh Dunkley in isolation. Yep. North have a player, Essendon have a player. Uh, just come out the Saints player, Rowan Marshall was also the tier one exposure site. So I think the thing that I just want to touch on um, before we move on to the rest of the episode, I think there's a little bit of commentary about why players and or staff would be out and about, I guess. Um, I think the thing I just want to say is last year we all did pub life and we were under AFL protocols pretty much from, what would you say, May to September, May to October? Yep, yep. it was two weeks out from when training started. Yeah, so pretty much all that season. were under government protocols. Mm. So yeah. we basically spent the whole year under protocols. So yeah. and the AFL protocols are essentially lockdown protocols. So yeah. the AFL protocols mean you can only go out for um, essential items. Can't go into clothes stores. Um, can't go into cafes or restaurants. Can only can't get takeaways and, and sunbake outside in a park or on the beach. Not can't sit at the beach. You could go to the beach for a swim for recovery. Um, can't see family or friends unless it's one singular person and you're walking at the time. Yep. Um, so That's I just wanted to say, yeah, last year was really tough. So I think the idea behind obviously us moving to Melbourne to get out of the Sydney lockdown and then us then moving on to Queensland last week was to try and give players and staff um, that if you have to be away from home, at least we'll give you 
give you a bit of flexibility around that, operate under the state government guidelines as they stood um, and just be able to, to, to give people some semblance of a life when they're away from home and still try and keep the competition going. Well, that's the thing is that fundamentally we, we were under no restrictions were in Melbourne and you're just making decisions all the time. You know, there, there, was zero lock, there was zero live cases in local transmission in Victoria when the guys went to the rugby, you know, and you guys went to rugby. So, you know, you can't live your life in fear forever. You're obviously always trying to make really good decisions. Um, but, you know, for example, now, you know, if you're in Adelaide, you're probably not going to go out for a coffee if there's a couple floating around as a footballer because you know that that's risky. So, you know, we're making those decisions and unfortunately – retrospectively you find out that someone was there with um, local transmission. So you know, they're the challenges and you just want trying to make sure that as much as possible you can have some form of res- res- that resembles a normal life and often we're under stricter restrictions than the actual government. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So let's move on because you have a very interesting topic for this week's Fill Me In. So it is your turn to tell us whatever you want about whatever topic is on your mind this week. And I've, you had a you had a few topics floating around. Some weeks were were a bit uh, a bit all over the place in terms of what you might want to talk about. But you've got a a very interesting one this week. Yep, just want to quickly just touch on Dusty Martin. Obviously, um, prior to me, the most recent kidney was Tom Lonigan and Nick mm. Maxwell. Nick Maxwell bruised it. Tom Lonigan lost his. Then I had mine and I was very fortunate that those two people were very good in communicating with me when I was coming back and then to see Dusty go down with a kidney injury, obviously, um, thinking of him, obviously a champion of the game, but I think he's still in hospital, so hopefully he's going mm. okay. So we contemplated going down talking about kidneys, mm. but we decided to leave that there. But <laughs> I decided we're a bit late, but on the succession plan for coaching, Obviously, I think this is becoming more relevant this week because I think the question is going to be there till the end of the year and obviously comes off the back of uh, Alistair Clarkson and Sam Mitchell putting in place a, a succession plan at uh, Hawthorne, which has Alistair Clarkson, Clarkson coaching out this year and next year and Sam Mitchell taking over in 2023. And I think the question is raised again today and this week uh, around whether it's sustainable for, for Sam Mitchell to still be the two I see next year when he knows he's going to take over the following year. Yeah, and I think, you know, I can talk for – I think there are two types of circumstances of which a succession plan happens, and this is just, you know, just guessing. But the one that I experienced at the Giants was you've got a senior coach – who eventually wants to give it up and a young buck is brought in to take over, which I think you could quite clearly see with Kevin Sheedy and Leon Cameron. And mm-hmm. I think that works really well. Paul Ruse and Simon Goodwin's another one that resembles that. And I think in that situation, um, you get to a point where the, the senior coach is still coaching but also wants to make it as smooth as possible. And so they're really pushing through um, the younger coach and giving them some really good guidance. So for us, you know, Sheeds was the coach, but he gave Leon so much leniency and space that, you know, by the end of the year, Leon was basically coaching us. So it's an extremely um, selfless role by Sheedy at the time. And I believe the same was with Paul Ruse and Simon Goodwin. And, you know, I think it's a great model in that circumstance. And then I guess from, you know, without knowing the answers on the other end is, um, Malthouse and Buckley, where Malthouse, I believe, still wanted to coach. I think he's said that um, quite a bit, that he wanted to coach on. This was obviously down the track, not at the time. But then mm. Nathan Buckley was ready to be a senior coach and obviously a great of Collingwood, and then you try to make that work. And then from what I can gather is that Clarkson agreed to it, but the rumours and innuendo is that he still wants to coach. But obviously, Sam Mitchell is a, is a great young coach too and Hawthorne was stuck in that position. So, um, you know, Buckley had a terrific coaching career, so there's no doubt that that was obviously successful. But it's a, it's a different dynamic if, if, if I can judge the situation from, from an outsider. But obviously, not knowing that, I can only talk from my experience. My experience is, is that when you're doing succession planning as, with a coach, and they're both working together. You need a senior coach 
who is very, you know, open to the idea of, you know, teaching, mentoring, giving someone space to grow into the role as the year goes on because that made it the most smooth for us. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, it was probably um, a, quite a unique scenario where Sheeds was clearly coming to the end of his um, his coaching career, and he probably, in all uh, in all respects, took on the Giants' job as an opportunity to to help set up the club, not necessarily because he was looking to go back into coaching. So it seems like at the time that 20, uh, 2013, 2014 transition year did work really successfully, and it was almost a seamless transition. Yeah, no, it definitely um, worked out that way. But as you say, Sheeds was at a diff- different stage in his career mm. and did just a mountain of work off the field. Um, I probably don't think you could start the club like Sheeds did from that point of view, plus be the full, full-time coach. Like mm. it would just be like out of control. So, um, yeah, it ended up being a very seamless, especially for us as players, and then sort of when Leon took over, round, the difference between round 23, 2013 and round 1, 2014 was not much at all really in terms of especially how game day went because they'd done mm-hmm. such a great job at integrating Leon into sort of the, the senior role but no questions barred, you know, in the sense of like Sheeds was still the coach. If there had to be a call made, Sheeds was in charge and he made that final call. Yeah, interesting. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how this one unfolds over the next 12 to 18 months. Anything else to add on that one? No, I think it's always a, a challenging position for um, any club when you've got really good people inside. I guess you can you know, relate it to having a you know 29-year-old star midfielder and a 21-star midfielder who wants more time in the midfield, but how do you get mm-hmm. that to work? Um, mm-hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all pans out, but... Clarkson said he's happy with it and we'll be there to teach uh, Mitchell along the way. So it'll be a uh, it'll be good to watch. Obviously, Clarkson's renowned as probably the greatest ever coach or one of. So you couldn't be taught by a better person. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this let's bring this one home. So it's time to wrap up and I reckon in a week like this, tips uh, and recommendations are highly sought after by someone who's sitting in isolation for another week. Yeah, uh, my initial tip won't help you at all. (laughs) Um, I've found that I've kept myself predominantly busy with um, three things um, of which none will now help you. But (laughs) one is loitering at breakfast, lunch and dinner. So yep. at home, I'm a very efficient breakfast eater. Like I'll be down, I would have set it up and eaten within 10 minutes and I move on. While here, breakfast can be up to a 30 to 40 minute process for me when I get to- caught talking and yada, yada, yada. And then the next one that I found was coffees. Coffees have been mm-hmm. a great time waster. So linked to the first one. Mm-hmm. And then the third one has been doing lots of pool recovery. So mm. we're lucky here that there's a hot spa and ice bath next to each other. So that's been a big, uh, big time consumer. I must admit, I still think the phone's the devil. I get caught too mm. much in that. So um, my tip of the week is one that I'm about to take on board myself. And that is I'm about to order myself some mindfulness coloring in books. Oh, I like that. So Just that's to, is it to stop scrolling? To stop the scrolling, yeah. So I've obviously... Mm. I've got lots of uni to do and I've, that's been, you know, filling in some of my time but it doesn't excite me and I still can get lo- lost in the world of my phone. So mindfulness coming in is my uh, my agenda and item for next and that's my tip. Yeah, I had a great plan this week in that I really needed to get my screen time down but I reckon I'm going to abandon that for another seven days and whatever will be, will be. Yeah, I think you've got to give yourself some little bit of liberty on that one. Yeah, and as we said, as we mentioned last week, we, I spoke about that I was rewatching The Good Wife, so I'm going to work my way through that one. We've been having some survivor watch parties with our quarantine crew. Uh, we watched the F1 the other night uh, via teams together. Yep. Um, there is a good different sport, but on KO, there's a good West Tigers documentary. And the first episode came out yesterday. Yes, so it's always I did good see to that watch. Yep. 
Yep. So that one was good. I did that over lunch today, but um, yeah, I guess if anyone has any tips of must watches, please let me know. I've got a few on my list already. Series would be the preference because they drag out. Yeah, but I'm also trying to do the thing where I was like, I don't want to spend the whole time watching TV. TV. Fortunately, you can do the job from your your room. You've been organizing things from your room. Yeah, so a lot of my stuff can be done. So I think like that's where I'm in a better position than someone like Akira and Briggs or uh, Toby Green, Jake Steen's the other one, and Matt Zabor, where I think they're probably climbing walls at the moment. Um, But that's okay. I I can afford it because I feel as though I would become, I'd be inspired at the start to do my training. And then by like day 10, I'd just be like in the biggest hole ever. And I argue it would drag <laughs> me down boredom wise. So good luck to all the players at our club and around the comp for doing that. And everyone just keep an eye out. We're hopefully going to organize a photo and we'll send it up about how we've done this podcast today. <laughs> we'll see what we can bring with you, bring to you. Thank you, Phil. Again, um, look, we'll see where we do next week's episode from, whether I'm in, out, whether we wait till Wednesday and see how we go. Well, good luck, Alison, and uh, go the Giants.